Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Sadly, Doug couldn't do this episode, but since he's not here, hopefully that means the intro won't cut me. First up this week, NASA has announced the astronauts who will be using the first rockets and capsules supplied by commercial companies such as SpaceX and Boeing. These nine people have various amounts of experience in space before now, with the commander of the last shuttle mission being one of the chosen, but there's also someone going to space for the first time. Since the shuttle stopped flying back in 2011, NASA has had to use Russian craft to transport people to space, so these future missions are the first time since then that American rockets have taken Americans to space from America, as the US Space Agency administrator says. Some more space news next, as the oldest igneous meteorite has been discovered. Recently discovered in northwest Africa, this meteorite shows that chemically evolved crustal rocks were actually forming on bodies in the early solar system before terrestrial planets had even been established, and it also means that some meteorites look very different to others, being lighter coloured. In addition, this meteorite formed during one of the earliest periods of volcanism in the solar system, and it provides some important information on how the celestial bodies in our system actually came about. Now for a bit of slightly uplifting news, as it seems there could be hope for corals. A new study published this week replicated the experiments done in a 1970 study that identified the temperatures corals could get to before bleaching and dying off. The good news is, in this new study fewer of the same coral species tested in the 70s were dying at high temperatures, and bleaching occurred later across all the species tested than in 1970. So it seems corals are becoming more tolerant of warmer sea temperatures. However, the bad news is that at the rate the sea temperature is increasing, corals likely won't be able to adapt fast enough in the future. Some interesting implications for shark evolution were revealed this week, with a new study that looked at how shark diversity changed after the end Cretaceous extinction. By studying the shape of hundreds of shark teeth from before and after the end of the Cretaceous, they found that the shark diversity we see around us today could have been caused by the mass extinction. Before the event, lamniform sharks were the most diverse group in the seas, but today carcariniforms are more diverse. More information is still needed, but it is possible that the extinction of various food sources and subsequent changes in which prey items were available played a large role in this switchover of shark diversity during the Cenozoic. Next, we have a very unique discovery from Alaska, a fossilised trackway that preserves therizinosaur and hadrosaur footprints together. Coming from a formation that dates to the late Cretaceous, the authors of the paper announcing the discovery say that it could be representative of a kind of dinosaur superhighway between Asia and North America. Hadrosaur remains are common from the area in Alaska, but they'd never been found with therizinosaurs before. However, in Asia, where therizinosaurs are better known, there are some hadrosaur skeletons associated with therizinosaurs. Using this as evidence, along with the possible existence of similar environments on both continents at this time, the authors suggest that Alaska was a superhighway region that dinosaurs travelled through as they migrated between continents millions of years ago. Talking of dinosaurs, it turns out that they had the pleasure of smelling flowers. By looking at flowers preserved in Cretaceous amber, it was found that they possessed very similar secretory tissues that some flowers today have, meaning they were perhaps producing the same liquids and scents that are made today in order to attract pollinators all that time ago. Now we move on to some pretty significant and truly fascinating news that came out this last week. Human species have evolved small body size two different times on the same island. You've probably heard of Homo floresiensis before, better known as the hobbits, an extinct species of small humans that inhabited Flores Island in Indonesia. Well, there's also a living population of small-bodied humans that still exist on the island, and a study published this week examined the genetic information from a group of these people that live near the cave where the Homo floresiensis remains were found, to see if there's any relation. As it turns out, there was past gene flow between this population and Denisovans and Neanderthals, but there was never any interbreeding with Homo floresiensis. Therefore, this means that insular dwarfism occurred twice in hominins on the island of Flores, a quite remarkable instance of convergent evolution. Oh, also, as I've mentioned Neanderthals, it seems the Russo brothers, directors of films such as Captain America Civil War and Avengers Infinity War, are going to be directing a film called The Last Neanderthal. I don't think much is known about it at the moment, other than apparently it's an epic adventure and a tale of survival, revenge and redemption, and there will be a lot of motion capture. Finally, this week a brand new species of prehistoric wombat was discovered in Australia, named, nope, not even gonna try, 
It was found in Miocene rocks, and this new species helps to further clarify and add context to wombat evolution, which is not well known at all. Also thanks to the Cave Lionator 428 on Discord for bringing the last three news stories to my attention. Thank you for watching this week's 7 Days of Science, I hope you enjoyed it. And don't worry, Doug will be back to do next week's episode, unless... Doug's dead. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon for another Animal of the Week.